Welcome everyone back to another episode of We Are Being Transformed. This is a podcast where we discuss the myriad of ways in which people transform and in turn are transformed by the culture, primarily through the mechanisms of myth, lore, and ritual. Today, our guest is the incredible and brilliant Dr. Ivan Moroshnikov. <laughs> and uh, he did not pay me to say that. Uh, so welcome, Ivan. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Glad to be here. Welcome. Welcome. The pleasure's all mine. Um, so Yvonne is a man who knows a thing or two about um, a little text from Nag Hammadi that we are uh, very familiar with and um, is super, super important in the lore and the, also the mythology of our modern world because there's so many misconceptions about it. Um, the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, he has a monograph called The Gospel of Thomas and Plato. Uh, highly recommended. It's available on Brill through open access. Anything from like uh, anything you wanted to know about the use of icon, the word icon in uh, Middle Platonic <laughs> terminology, you know, that will be exhausted there. Uh, very much came in handy and I nerded out to stuff like that. So, um, Yvonne, um, with the Gospel of Thomas, could you give us a brief rundown about Thomas? Because there's so many misconceptions, like I said, about the text and what it represents. Um, so if you could just give us kind of like a no frills, brief uh, rundown of the provenance and what the Gospel of Thomas is. Right. So the Gospel of Thomas is, a, as you said, a very short text, um, which is not really a gospel because it doesn't have any um, narrative, any story about Jesus, uh, but rather it's a collection of sayings and uh, modern scholars divided this collection into 114 units. It's important to understand that this is our, uh, you know, present day uh, understanding of the text, but these numbers are not in the text. And if you look at the history of scholarship, you'll see that other uh, scholars and quite, you know, uh, smart people would actually divide the text differently. So there is this consensus which does not necessarily mean that it is, you know, true. Um, uh, so, so it begins with an incipit, uh, the short kind of introductory statement, which in the Coptic text goes like this. These are the secret sayings which the living Jesus spoke, in which Didymus Judas Thomas wrote down. And then comes uh, what is usually designated saying one, which goes, and he said, whoever finds the interpretation of these sayings, will not experience death. And then the question is, who said that? Is it Thomas who says that, or is it the living Jesus who said that? Um, so this text um, is known to us in one Coptic manuscript, which comes from the Nag Hammadi discovery. Uh, so it's Nag Hammadi Codex II, and uh, it's the text of this Nag Hammadi Codex II that can be divided into 114 saints. But before this Coptic text was discovered, we actually had, as it turns out, three other manuscripts of this text, which come from a site in Egypt called Axorhynchus, and uh, where uh, already in the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, a uh, British uh, archaeolo uh, archaeological team discovered uh, three small uh, papyrus fragments which come from three different uh, manuscripts of the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, so we know that this text existed in Greek and we know that it was more or less the same as what we have in Coptic, although there are interesting differences. Um, but it was only after the discovery of the Coptic text that uh, you know we, the academic community, actually realized that this is all this uh, pieces of uh, writing material actually uh, belong to the same text, bear witness to the same text. Um, we don't really know when this text was written. Uh, there are different theories. Uh, some people would put it very early in the history of Christianity. Uh, they would connect it to the so-called Saint Gospel Q and would say that it's like a first century, uh, you know, record of what ultimately is, you know, mostly uh, accurate sayings by Jesus. Um, 
Other people would say that no, it's very late uh, hodgepodge of uh, synoptic uh, of sayings from the Gospels that are in the Bible and that it was composed somewhere towards the end of the second uh, century. Uh, ultimately, it's very difficult to say anything and, you know, for people who work with um, texts, ancient texts, and manuscripts, it's, it's evident that uh, you know, unless there is a reference to some historical event, uh, it's it's basically impossible to to be certain about dates. Um, the thing that we know for certain is that this text was written in Greek. It has been suggested by some that there was a Syriac forlage that the original was written in Syriac. Uh, but this, I think, has been uh, very uh, convincingly disproven by many scholars, uh, most recently by uh, uh, Simon Gathercole. So, so this text was written in Greek, like the vast majority of, of the Christian texts. And uh, well, we might um, discuss its um, textual history, its compositional history. Uh, ultimately, there are two options. It's, I think, obvious for anybody who would read this text carefully that it is actually um, a collection of rather diverse material, a material that must come from different sources. So basically, we have two options. Either we can imagine a, a compiler who sits in a library like this one, picks different books from different shelves and, uh, you know, produces this, uh, um, you know, collection of uh, various sayings that derive from different sources. Or we can imagine a graduate process of development, uh, textual development. And this is indeed something that uh, we know uh, took place with various uh, texts of uh, the same genre, that collections of sayings, uh, texts that do not have any particular structure, right? These uh, collections tend to evolve over time, tend to grow. And uh, to me, the second option seems to be more uh, plausible. I would think that the Gospel of Thomas we have today is actually something that, uh, you know, grew over time. Uh, but as I said, I would ultimately say that what we have in Greek and what we have in Coptic uh, bears witness to more or less the same recension of this text. And this recension was definitely around already in the, uh, somewhere in the uh, second uh, century. That's, I think, all we can say about the dates and the compositional history. It's extremely hard. And um, what I think is much, much more important is just to read the text and to try to make sense of it and to, you know, approach it not from the perspective of its hypothetical sources, but to see it as a, as a work of literature, which is in its own way unique and, uh, you know, fascinating. Thomas, you would place Thomas firmly in the genre of the wisdom sayings. A word that sometimes is used is uh, gnomology. It's, um, so it's gnomology being like a collection of gnomes, wise sayings. Right. Um, this is not the best term because the word itself was not used in antiquity, uh, but uh, the genre definitely existed. Uh, the word wisdom, we shouldn't use, we shouldn't probably use it, uh, you know, in a technical sense history of research on the Gospel of Thomas, there was this trend and very important trend to see the Gospel of Thomas as uh, a manifestation of this uh, wisdom literature tradition. And there is this great book by uh, Stephen Davis, um, uh, The Gospel of Thomas and Christian Wisdom, uh, which is an amazing, a very bold attempt to basically say that the message of the Gospel of Thomas is the same message uh, that we find in, uh, you know, the wisdom of Solomon and, you know, other texts like that. Um, and then he would say that Jesus of the Gospel of Thomas is actually 
manifestation of divine wisdom. That was that's a great book, which I strongly recommend to everyone. But I think um, we just cannot overlook the huge difference uh, between the worldview we find in the Gospel of Thomas and that of the Jewish wisdom literature. Um, the most important point being, of course, that according to the Gospel of Thomas, our world is not good, which is something right. that... <laughs> which is something that the authors of wisdom literature would probably not accept. So uh, probably not use the term wisdom in this sense. Uh, it's not necessarily, you know, uh, something I would use to describe the genre of our text. But uh, certainly when it comes to the structure, to the typology, uh, it has a lot in common with those things, collections that belong to this wisdom tradition. That's how I would put it. That's a great point. Um, I think just from my own perspective, uh, when I look at something like Thomas um, and these kind of florilegium um, that we're mm -hmm. drawing from multiple sources of wisdom, um, I think the best example for me, like when I look at something like Thomas, is uh, another book in Nag Hammadi uh, called Sentences of Sextus. Mm -hmm. So we know that Sentences of Sextus, I guess, um, is drawing from a source that Porphyry seems to also have access to. He he seems to draw um, from these sayings in his epistle to uh, Marcella. Um, so they're kind of using this source in common, but it's for vastly different purposes. And I like how it shows just how um, flexible these traditions could be. Um, um, it also it shows that um, these things aren't as cut and dry as we. Uh, would like to think when we try to put them into little boxes of uh, quote unquote genres. Um, we'd yeah. like to and talk, talking them. about talking about common sources, uh, that's actually another big problem for us. When um, we find stuff uh, in church fathers or in Manichaean texts, so you know texts that belong to this uh, great uh, dualistic religion, which was Manichaeism. Uh, when we find stuff that is very similar to what we have in the Gospel of Thomas, almost verbatim the same, and uh, something that is even introduced as a Jesus saying, and something that we don't find anywhere else, but can we really think, can we really claim that this is a saying that comes from the Gospel of Thomas? Uh, that's impossible uh, to say because, on the one hand, we know that the Manichaeans read the Gospel of Thomas, uh, and uh, many church fathers explicitly say that they are familiar with the title, but because they don't say that they are quoting from this text, uh, it is always possible that they are quoting from something else, that the Gospel of Thomas and these guys share a common ancestor, and uh, that's, that's quite disappointing. Although um, in, in my work I found it uh, extremely important to look for uh, you know, the context in which sayings that might or might not be Thomasine, uh, you know, exist in this other text, specifically in uh, Didymus the Blind, who is, I think, an extremely important author. Uh, Can't really say, I guess, um, when it all comes down to it, where, where these ideas come from, but they're just kind of in the air. Uh, it also reminds me of another um, text that we have in Nag Hammadi, that, uh, The Wisdom of Jesus Christ, text called Eugnostus is uh, the source of the wisdom of Jesus Christ. Although uh, I, I think, you know, this is not a universally accepted claim, like some people would uh, mm -hmm. probably think about a different scenario. And, uh, you know, that's, that's quite normal for um, ancient writers to, you know, recycle texts, recycle ideas, uh, in my more recent research, I've been uh, working on uh, the so-called apocryphal acts of the apostles in the Coptic tradition. And you can see how often a story associated with, let's say, uh, Philip becomes uh, all of a sudden a story about uh, Apostle Andrew, just because for some reason the author or the, comp uh, the compiler of a certain text felt that this would work in, in his composition. Uh, so yeah, that's that's absolutely not a problem for an ancient writer to use, recycle, revise, uh, adapt, and so forth. 
So ultimately, what's your assessment of Thomas in this model? Like, if it is fit into this model as a, as for lack of a better term, a smorgasbord of different ideas, um, is middle platonism just one, um, one aspect of it, or is middle platonism mm. the driving factor in Thomas? There to say that. I know what the uh, driving factor in Thomas is. Um, uh, what I really like is this quote I have in the beginning of my uh, book from uh, uh, Stobaeus, uh, where it says that Plato uh, had uh, many voices, that Plato was uh, uh, polyphonic, you know, that when you read Plato, you never hear the voice of Plato himself, right? You always hear voices of different characters and uh, they together constitute uh, Plato's voice. So Plato is polyphonic, but also, but he's not, you know, he's of many voices, but he's not of many ideas. Like he is still a consistent thinker. And the same is true for Thomas, I think. Ultimately, uh, we cannot just say that this is a uh, hodgepodge of various uh, sources, various notions. You know, there is like apocalyptic Judaism there, wisdom tradition here, Platonism, synoptic stuff, and this is all just, uh, you know, mixed together to amuse the reader or to just confuse everybody. I think that the Gospel of Thomas is polyphonic, but also it is in a sense symphonic. So it always um, points in a certain direction. Uh, it's um, actually a comparison with Plato is kind of uh, informative here. In 20th century scholarship, there was this very um, um, strong tradition of uh, German, in, in German academia, uh, many people would think that the dialogues of Plato uh, did not really have any um, doctrines, right? That they were just uh, exercise exercises uh, produced to show how you know uh, philosophical research can be conducted but what Plato actually uh, thought was expressed only in this so-called unwritten doctrines uh, so the secret teaching of the academia uh, that was transmitted orally um, and so, so the dialogues are just to advertise for, you know, Platonism, but they don't really make any dogmatic pos uh, positive claims. And that's, of course, not far removed from what happened to Plato's Academy soon after he died. The Academy of Plato became a skeptic school. And that's how the skeptics would uh, take it, right? They would think that, well, the, the only point Plato is making is that you can basically prove anything, like, you know. Um, but that's demonstrably false, right? Like when you read Plato's dialogues, you certainly would encounter problems. You certainly would see that there are certain, uh, you know, not uh, contradictions, but, you know, thoughts that do not necessarily immediately, uh, are not necessarily in harmony with each other. So, you know, even though I think if you do a bit of slow reading, you would eventually find out that, you know, Again, Plato is quite consistent. But in any event, Plato never tells you that the world is made up of, let's say, atoms and void. You know, that's something that you would never find in Plato's dialogues. There is always a certain uh, trajectory, a certain, um, you know, uh, direction to Plato's thinking. And uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure that the same holds true for Thomas, even though. Sometimes we may find a certain, uh, you know, exegetical problem when we read the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is quite consistent in thinking that the world is bad and uh, that there is this, uh, you know, inner uh, self that somehow transcends this world uh, and stuff like that. So uh, definitely uh, not just a hodgepodge of ideas. Definitely a text that was uh, that uh, reflects a certain um, uh, a certain person, like uh, something that was produced by a uh, 
reductor, let's say, that had a very clear idea of what is right and what is wrong and how, you know, the world works, so to say. I was going to ask just in terms of uh, getting a little bit more into Thomas's uh, worldview. Um, there are certain sayings in these texts that um, are the best. Uh, if you use middle Platonism the her as the heuristic device to understand them, uh, for example, 56, 80, I think you have 19 sayings in all. Um, middle Platonism explains these best versus, uh, so, say, Stoicism and Cynicism. So I didn't know if you could just get into that a little bit and hmm. kind of explain why um, this middle platonic thought is the wellspring of many of these Thomasine sayings and not, say, the thought of Stoicism or Cynicism at the time. I think, generally speaking, um, Platonism was just a logical ally for Christians. Uh, Platonism teaches that the cause of this world is outside of this world, right? Uh, whereas Stoics would be uh, naturalists, right? That, uh, you know, God and the world are ultimately uh, the same. And uh, this does not really marry well with uh, the Judeo-Christian notion, whereas the Platonist notion, uh, the Platonist metaphysics, um, is not something that clearly contradicts uh, the Christian uh, myth. I mean, of course it does. Of course, when you read, uh, you know, this uh, uh, critics of Christianity like Celsus, you would see that they, from their Platonist perspective, thought that, uh, you know, Christianity is nonsense. Like the idea of, like, say, incarnation is ridiculous because, um, you know, gods cannot change because gods or God is perfect, and therefore uh, God cannot really transform because transformation means change from one state to another. And in, in the case of God, this would be change from a better state to a worse state. Why would God do that? That's against the nature of God, right? So you know, the whole idea of incarnation is nonsensical. But even the Orthodox tradition, you know, the one that actually accepts the notion of incarnation, finally came to terms with Platonism, as we see in, uh, you know, the Cappadocian fathers and, uh, you know, later developments. Uh, ultimately, in the Gospel of Thomas and in many, I think, many other early Christian texts, we just see the first steps towards this happy marriage. And in the case of the Gospel of Thomas, it, of course, makes even better sense because the Gospel of Thomas is not really uh, big on flesh. And uh, the notion of incarnation is not something that you can easily find in the Gospel of Thomas. I mean, you can argue that it's there, that it's hinted at, um, and we can discuss that. But uh, uh, with the Gospel of Thomas, which, for instance, never uses the term Christ when, when talking about uh Jesus, right? It's always uh, Jesus, or the living Jesus. Uh, so the Gospel of Thomas is, in a sense, uh, more open. Uh, the the religious feeling, the this uh, metaphysical sentiment, so to say, we find in the Gospel of Thomas is more open to Platonism simply because the Gospel of Thomas does not seem to be that into those elements of Christian religion that actually made uh, Platonists very angry. <laughs> so uh, when I was defending my dissertation, I was supposed to offer this so-called Lectio Precursoria. Uh, so I was supposed to give like a 20 minutes talk about uh, something related to my research. And I, I, I thought that it would be fun to play this, uh, you know, uh, game to do this mental experiment. What if Celsus uh, you know, what would happen if he read the Gospel of Thomas? Would Celsus <laughs> find the Gospel of Thomas not acceptable? And I think ultimately Celsus would say, yeah, that's okay. Like, <laughs> the Gospel of Thomas does not talk about the things that make Celsus angry. And that's very interesting. Um, so, yes, I would say that the Gospel of Thomas, uh, for, for people behind the Gospel of Thomas, Platonism was a natural ally. Uh, I wouldn't say that who these people, uh, 
war platonists in any meaningful way, not in the sense of, um, uh, you know, the people behind this so-called platonizing Sethian texts that you discussed with Dylan recently. Uh, but uh, I would say that uh, the Platonist tradition somehow, probably indirectly, uh, made its way into the, uh, you know, uh, the worldview of these people. And uh, even though it's not... Uh, like present in the totality of Thomasine sayings, it's present in a important part of them. And that's, I think, significant. Uh, but as I said before, I wouldn't say that there is a driving force in the Gospel of Thomas. And you can easily say that, uh, you know, the uh, biblical uh, myth is as important, uh, biblical narrative, you know, uh, improved by supplemented with various apocryphal traditions about biblical characters is as important for understanding the Gospel of Thomas as a text. It's just, it so happens that usually people who work on the Gospel of Thomas are more familiar with the Bible and with the apocrypha and with the stuff like that than they are with the Platonist tradition. So that was my kind of goal to show that there is this element in Thomas that needs to be uh, understood. So you heard it here, folks. Calcis would definitely approve of the Gospel of Thomas. <laughs> Thomas gets the stamp of approval from Calcis. Um, so thank you for that, Dr. Miroshnikov. That's a that's a first. I will credit you endlessly for that. Uh, yeah, but just getting into what you're saying, I mean, they're not. Uh, I, I don't like just like nobody would say I'm a Sethian Christian or a Sethian Gnostic. Mm -hmm probably at the time. Nobody's going to say I'm a platonic Christian or, uh, or um, I have a, a friend of mine and a, a great scholar, Dr. M. David Litwa. Uh, he has this model called dynamic cultural exchange. And uh, in this, uh, a good way of looking at it is, you know, early Christians and Jews and, you know, also pagans wouldn't consciously admit to using the building blocks of their culture. Like, for instance, if, if early Christ, Jewish Christians are using the building blocks of deification and imperial cult, right, uh, they're not going to consciously admit that, um, that they're using those in their conceptualization of God. But it's also very interesting, you know, these things were ubiquitous in the ancient world. You know, you have uh, the gods everywhere. You have these thought processes. If you, go, if you even go through the smallest um, bit of Paideia at the time, you're going to be exposed to these middle platonic concepts. Um, you're going to... Uh, be exposed to these allegorizing ideas um, and these wisdom sayings. So it's very interesting, just the dynamics that are going on. So what I think my next question would be to um, ask you specifically about two sayings uh, that are kind of parallel in Thomas that I really like that you pointed out in your book, sayings 56 and 80. So I didn't know if you could kind of go through those a little bit and kind of explain what's going on there, um, these concepts, because it's very fascinating. You go through the the philosophical terminology of the Greek and what, what it would mean to certain readers versus others. So uh, the, the two sayings that he mentioned are so-called doublet. So there was this Icelandic scholar, Aus Gerson, who uh, I think his dissertation was uh, dedicated to the rhetorics of Thomas. And it's, it's a difficult read, um, but it's ultimately, I guess, the only study that talks about the poetic side of the Gospel of Thomas. Um, and the thing is that the Gospel of Thomas certainly uses a certain set of rhetorical formal devices. So even though the text is not structured as a narrative, it has uh, certain elements, uh, which I also discuss in my book, like, uh, you know, chiasm or parallelism in general. And so there is also this thing um, called the doublets, when you have um, sayings that are very similar. And uh, of course, one could say that this is because they come from two different sources. So somebody compiled them, uh, com used these two sources, and just didn't notice that it had the same material, which is, I think, somewhat disrespectful of this ancient people. And I think if this text has this twice, then there is a point to this. So sayings uh, 56 and 80. Uh, saying 80 
and I'm going to read from Landon's translation. Jesus said, he who has recognized the world, so the world is cosmos, right? It's a Greek word, has found the body. And he who has found the body is superior to the world. So here, uh, the world is identified with the body. And the first part of the saying would not be a problem to anyone uh, familiar with Greek philosophy, because that's something you find not only in Plato, but in fact in, in the Stoic tradition as well. Uh, the notion that uh, the world is a body. But uh, the thing is that uh, the world, according to these people, is never just a body. It's a body with a soul. It's a living being. So even in Plato, who, you know, is talking about the Demiurge and uh, the world uh, that is uh, transcendent to our world, even for Plato, the, the world has a soul, right? And uh, the same is for Stoics. The world is a living being. So that's why it's so interesting to, re to read saying 80 uh, together with uh, saying 56 together with doublet because saying 56 says uh, Jesus said whoever has come to understand the world has found a corpse and whoever has found a corpse is superior to the world so this is interesting because here we learn that the world is just a corpse that there is no uh, uh, you know, there is no divine element to this world. And again, when we read this saying together, we can easily conclude the world is a corpse, uh, the, the, uh, the world is a body and therefore a corpse. The notion that our bodies are corpses is again something that we find in uh, philosophical literature, specifically in, in Platonic tradition. Uh, starting as early as Aristotle, who may have actually uh, came up with the metaphor. Um, this notion is repeated again and again in, in multiple Middle Platonist texts. Um, in, in Aristotle, uh, it uh, is connected with this very vivid image of uh, pirates who uh, capture, uh, you know, people, capture other ships, and then they would tie uh, their victims to um, corpses and, uh, you know, somehow torture them in this way. So, you know, this is like an experience, a horrific experience uh, that, you know, people captured by uh, pirates uh, have, right? So what Aristotle says is that we are the same. We are people tied to corpses. So, you know, the the, the human element would be our inner self and the corpse element would be our body. Uh, but this metaphor is never applied to the world because as we know, the world is not just a body, it's actually a living body. So, so what is interesting is that the Gospel of Thomas is playing, uh, is, is aware, is recycling these notions that uh, we find in, in uh, you know, Hellenistic text in, in Platonic, specifically Platonic texts, you know, goes a step further. It says uh, the world is actually just a body. Uh, there is no um, element that is salvageable uh, to this world, uh, no redeeming element in this world. Uh, and by doing so, uh, it seems the Gospel of Thomas is even inventing a uh, uh, a pun that I, I don't think exists anywhere else. So in in Plato, uh, we find this famous uh, play on words soma and sema, uh, which is usually uh, understood as the body is a, a tomb, but um, in, in, in reality, I mean, it's difficult because sema can have other meanings, but ultimately sema is this sign that you put above above the someone's grave. So, I mean, and ultimately this is how this saying was understood by, by later um, interpreters of Plato. 
in Plato, we find the sema, soma, uh, you know, pan or moro, whatever you call it. Uh, interestingly, uh, in later Platonic tradition, uh, we find a similar uh, play on the words demas and desmos. Uh, so demas would be one of the words that you can use when talking about a body. And uh, desmos uh, means uh, chain or bond. So again, there's this um, attempt to encapsulate uh, the Platonist notion that the body is a prison and the body is a tomb, encapsulated in a uh, short and uh, memorable formula, right? So soma sema demas desmos, and then the Gospel of Thomas uh, probably invents or maybe follows uh, a tradition that just didn't survive. Uh, but the Gospel of Thomas uh, has this other pun soma ptoma which I think is uh, uh, really remarkable and which shows that the Gospel of Thomas is actually a rather creative text, or like the people behind the Gospel of Thomas were actually rather creative. Um, so to sum up, uh, what I'm trying to argue uh, in my book is that the Gospel of Thomas is drawing upon this uh, Platonist tradition, uh, but at the same time is... Uh, not it, it, it remains faithful to its basic um, message, the message that uh, is actually, in some respects, different from, uh, you know, what a Platonist would normally say. Um, although, of course, this is not the whole truth. So, according to the Gospel of Thomas, the world is a corpse, but, and this is. Another thing that does not have a direct relation uh, to Platonism, uh, but I think it's, it's, it's just important to say here that according to the Gospel of Thomas, there is still somehow a certain salvific element present in the world, even though it is not of this world. Uh, and um, in my um, dissertation, I, I discuss this notion of like a certain secret, a certain code uh, that an attentive reader of the Gospel of Thomas uh, uh, can decipher so that they can find this salvific element in the world. And I think this is uh, what quite a few sayings in the Gospel of Thomas are all about. So, for instance, uh, the saying that is at the very end of the text, saying uh, 113, uh, where Jesus says that the kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth and men do not see it. And I think the same point actually um, is uh, of those sayings where Jesus is talking about, um, you know, I am, um, when Jesus says that, you know, lift, uh, lift a stone and I'm inside, uh, split a piece of wood and I'm there. Because this is, again, not... Um, uh, just random imagery. Wood and stone is actually um, something that a classical author would normally use to talk about something that has no soul, something that is lifeless, uh, something that is opposed to human virtue, human spirit. Uh, in Plutarch, uh, Spartan kings say that we don't need walls that are made of wood and stone because uh, Sparta is protected by the spirits of its citizens. So we don't need this lifeless stuff. So when Jesus says that he is within logs and stones, he is making the same point, I think, that he is definitely not logs and stones, but somehow mysteriously... There is this salvific element hidden within, encoded in this, in this, uh, you know, uh, material stuff. So, so the Gospel of Thomas is playing two fields. It's working with the various sorts of material, including the classical Platonist material, and at the same time, it's always staying true to its own message, which is, I think, also very important. I think that leads into. Uh, my next question, which is just the figure of Jesus and how mm. the Gospel of Thomas portrays him. Like, this isn't the Jesus that you find in something like the Gospel of Judas um, or something like uh, the Apocalypse of uh, 
or the secret revelation of John. You know, this is a very, uh, I don't know how to describe him, but, but Thomas has a very um, unique way of presenting Jesus. So I didn't know if you could talk about that briefly. This book that I already mentioned, um, uh, the one by Stephen Davis. Um, so Stephen Davis says that um, the Jesus of the Gospel of Thomas is basically the, uh, the wisdom, the divine personified wisdom of the Old Testament. And uh, indeed, there are some hints in the Gospel of Thomas uh, that I think should be taken seriously that actually point in that direction, right? Like when Jesus said that, you know, people were looking for me and uh, they couldn't find me, which is a direct quote from uh, from the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. So Jesus is actually saying the same thing that wisdom is saying in the Old Testament. Um, so there's that. But then, of course, um, Jesus is definitely more than uh, personified wisdom because again and again the Gospel of Thomas is trying to stress that it is not possible to actually describe or define Jesus. For instance, the most famous saying is uh, in this regard saying 113, uh, sorry 13, right? The one that's um, a dialogue between um, Jesus uh, Matthew, Simon, Peter, and Thomas. And, uh, you know, Simon Peter thinks that Jesus is an angel. Matthew says that he is a philosopher. And somehow we realize that this is not entirely true. It's important to know that, to point out that the Gospel of Thomas does not explicitly say that this is not true. Like, if you wish you can see a certain angelic element to Jesus or certain philosophical element to Jesus. Um, but, of course, it is clear that the answer that Thomas gives is the correct one. And then Thomas says uh, that his mouth is incapable of saying who Jesus is. And that's important. There is this, um, uh, this, there is this negative theology in the Gospel of Thomas, where ultimately when we talk about uh, the uh, things divine, the ultimate reality, there is nothing positive that we can say about it, right? Um, there is this uh, other saying that has been uh, quite a, a problem for many interpreters. That's about this... Um, gold coin with the face of Caesar on it, right? So the same stuff that we find in the synoptics, uh, so saying 100. Uh, so it goes, Jesus, uh, they showed Jesus a gold coin. We don't know who they are. The Gospel of Psalms doesn't say who they are. Uh, they show Jesus a gold coin and uh, say to him, Caesar's man demand taxes from us. And then, G and then uh, Jesus replies, Give Caesar what belongs to Caesar, give God what belongs to God, and give me what is mine. So there are different ways to understand this. People would think that this is a reference to, uh, uh, you know, Gnostic dualism, right? To the notion of the demiurge, that Jesus, uh, who is obviously divine, is somehow different from uh, God, right? That he is... Uh, realm is somehow completely separate from that of God, and therefore this God must be the God of the Old Testament, the, the God of creation. Um, but that doesn't have to be the case. Um, and obviously you can come up with different interpretations. The one that I enjoy, even though, of course, uh, here I must confess, it's very difficult to say something, uh, you know, with certainty. Uh, the one that I like is that um, this saying obviously presupposes the existence of what we have in the uh, in the synoptic gospels, and uh, it makes basically a correction. Um, the word God is not something that you find in the Gospel of Thomas very often. The point is about words, like as long as as soon as you name the ultimate reality as God, 
you apply certain positive notions to it. And somehow the Gospel of Thomas is not fond of it. So in the sense, he is saying, you know, there is this God that you talk about, that you apply positive um, ideas to, and there is me. And then about me, you cannot say anything because I'm, you know, beyond speech. And therefore, you know, give God what belongs to God and give God, uh, give me what is mine. So Jesus somehow is different, but not in this ontological sense, so to say, but in a gnosiological sense. Uh, so the Jesus of the Gospel of Thomas is, is uh, elusive. But as I said, I guess the most important thing is that he's never, is, is what the Gospel of Thomas doesn't say about him. So the Gospel of Thomas doesn't never says that uh, he is Christ. The Gospel of Thomas does use this Jewish epithet, and this is part of a uh, very strong anti-Jewish sentiment uh, expressed in many uh, Thomasine sayings. Uh, the Gospel of Thomas never says that uh, Jesus uh, rose from the dead, except maybe in one instance uh, where we have a difference between the Greek and the uh, Coptic uh, version. It is very unclear whether or not the Gospel of Thomas uh, claims that Jesus was crucified. It's not impossible, but even if he was crucified, this is not important. And even if he was resurrected, it is not important. The important thing is what Jesus says and uh, what John Kloppenburg called the sapiential research. So the important thing is the exegesis of the words of Jesus and the intellectual effort that allows you to comprehend, comprehend the truth inside these words and you know, receive uh, salvation, join the ultimate reality. So, yeah, ultimately you can say that Jesus is what he says, right? It's almost like yeah. a parallel, in a sense, to some of the hermetic uh, corpus, like just in terms of like the interaction between the reader and grasping and wrestling with those words and kind of um, trying to understand what's going on there. Uh, my final question, Dr. Maroshnikov, is uh, a more general one, but I think it needs to be asked. It would, should we consider the Gospel of Thomas a Gnostic text? It's difficult to say. Um, I wouldn't. Uh, I personally do not enjoy the term Gnosticism. Uh, but if we say, if we define Gnosticism the way it's usually defined, right? Like uh, this dualistic belief in, uh, you know, the ultimate reality and uh, a uh, the demerge of the Old Testament, right? These these two different um, uh, elements. Uh, I don't think there is this sort of dualism in the Gospel of Thomas. Although, as I said, if you really want to, you can find this uh, dualist element in some of the things. You can see some of the things in the Gospel of Thomas as a hint at this. Um, dualist worldview, and obviously, in the uh, when the Gospel of Thomas was discovered, it was immediately uh, recognized as a Gnostic text, right? Uh, for instance, Gertner, this uh, Swedish uh, theologian, uh, wrote his commentary on the Gospel of Thomas, which is actually not a bad commentary. He would just assume that this is all about you know the demerge, and uh, he would just uh, immediately proceed in this direction which shows, at least, that this text definitely uh, would be enjoyed, uh, could be enjoyed by people of uh, dualist um, conviction, right? Uh, like the Manichaeans, for instance, you know, we know that the Manichaeans read the Gospel of Thomas, um, but nothing in the Gospel of Thomas uh, clearly points at that. And um, I, I don't think this is the best strategy uh, to to label the Gospel of Thomas as Gnostic. Uh, that's, I think, the most important thing is about, about the Gospel of Thomas. It's, it's really, it resists any labeling. People tried different uh, categories. So, you know, 
there was uh, an attempt to place the Gospel of Thomas within a school of Thomas or Thomas sign trend in early Christianity, that somehow it was produced by a certain community of Thomas sign Christians and the same community would produce the Acts of Thomas and the Book of Thomas and, uh, you know, but this all is uh, extremely unlikely and implausible. And the same holds true for all these ideological labels, you know, Gnosticism, Apocalypticism, uh, wisdom tradition, uh, and even Platonism. You know, obviously, Platonism is not the only tool uh, to be used when working with the Gospel of Thomas. So I, I would again say that the Gospel of Thomas is a very uh, polyphonic text, and you know, it needs to be considered in its uniqueness. And I think it's actually, uh, and that's something I, I, I would like to stress. I think the Gospel of Thomas is good literature and it's actually produced by people who were uh, familiar with rhetorical devices and who would be very cleverly use these devices. And in this sense, uh, you know, we, we should really study the Gospel of Thomas on its own in its very unique, very particular, um, uh, you know, profile. I think ultimately, like the Jesus of the Gospel of Thomas, um, what Thomas is as a whole is really difficult to keep a grasp on. And uh, that's that's part of the beauty of it, though. I think it's, a, it's an amazing text to read. It's like, along with wisdom, uh, the wisdom sayings like from Thunder Perfect Mind, it's one of my favorite of those time. Um, Dr. Maroshnikov, this has been amazing. Feel free to use this time to um, plug anything you're working on, where people can find you, anything you feel we should know about. Um, my dissertation, which was published as a book, um, is uh, available um, in, in open access at uh, Brill. So you can, uh, anybody can download it for free legally. And uh, the same holds true for uh, this volume. Uh, Women and Knowledge in Early Christianity, which is a, um, a first shift to my uh, doctor father, Antti Marinen, and uh, which discusses all sorts of things, but includes, among other things, my article about uh, Thomas 114. And uh, I think it's great that uh, my former employer, the University of Helsinki, actually invested into making all this stuff open access. Uh, and hopefully, you know, uh, this is something that will ultimately be the case with most of scholarship. I think, uh, you know, today it's uh, really disastrous how how many important studies and tools are behind the paywall. So, Thank you for your scholarship. Thank you for lending your time and expertise to the show. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Yeah. Thank you so much, and I'll be happy to come again. Absolutely.